Hello, welcome to Be Make Do, a soul makers podcast where we talk about what it takes to pursue your calling as a culture maker with spiritual wholeness and creative freedom. I'm your host, Lisa Smith, here with our producer, Danny BH. Hello, everyone. And it is our passion to encourage and inspire you to become who you were created to be, make what you were created to make, and do what you were created to do. In our last episode, we wrapped up the overview of Be, Make, Do and the Soul Maker's threefold way of call. I focused on doing what you're created to do, which on one level is about taking all your character and spiritual formation, your gifts and talents, and then mobilizing them into action within your current context. But on another level, it's a call to artists of faith to consider their role as prophetic critics and imaginative visionaries. And I mentioned the book Reformation by Mark Nelson and Alan Hirsch. Well, I am so excited because to wrap up this series, we are going to have a conversation with Mark Nelson. I'm really excited to get to ask him more about how he sees the role of the artist in the world and the importance of story. I really love from what I already know about the book is both Mark and Alan's perspective of how they're re-looking at things. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we were all like enough to have that lens on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that goes to that, the title of the book, which (laughs) is Reformation. You'll hear me say reframation Mm -hmm. probably because I keep slipping into reframation. And I thought I said it wrong. (laughs) I thought I was saying it wrong. Right. No, it is reformation, which is cool because it's a nod to the reformation and the idea of changes and shifts that are happening in our culture and our and in the church today but also this idea of reframing the story not telling a different story but reframing the way that we talk about the story so i'm really excited to dig into this conversation with mark all right well let's get started Mark Nelson is the executive director of Three Rivers Collaborative in Knoxville, Tennessee, and served as lead pastor for a faith community called Crossings. In 2019, he co-authored Reframation, Seeing God, People, and Mission Through Reenchanted Frames with Alan Hirsch. He serves on the boards of Forge Global and Church Partners of the Smokies, as well as serving with 100 Movements Publishing. And I'm so grateful that you are with us today, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I appreciate the invitation. It's great to meet you and great to have a chat. Can you tell us a little bit about Reframation, uh, why you felt the need to write it, who it was for, what was was your impetus for for addressing that? Yeah, well, I've been in uh, vocational ministry for 36 years or so. And so I've done youth ministry, campus ministry, planted church, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't grow up uh with the arts i didn't grow up thinking that i grew up as a sports guy uh that's all i did i just played 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 and then something happened when i got a vocational ministry and i said oh there's a side to life that i have missed i didn't Mm. i wasn't cultured and nurtured by my parents necessarily wonderful parents but they just didn't push me that way but something happened in ministry and it i think it happened from this idea of understanding that i i have felt in 36 years of of vocational ministry, I've been called to put new frames around old pictures. That's that's my calling, regardless of what I've done in ministry. And that is this whole idea. And, and Frederick Beekner has a quote that kind of led me to this understanding. But uh, when you put a frame around a picture, you don't change the picture, but you change the way that picture is seen. You give it a, a chance to be seen a third or a fourth or a fifth time. It's yeah. the same analogy as uh, the, the wonderful movie Dead Poet Society when Robin Williams has them stand on the desk and see the world from a different place. Uh, you didn't change the room, but you changed the perspective of it. Right. I believe in ministry, this this picture of Jesus is the picture. And uh, I felt a calling, again, youth ministry, campus ministry, church playing, didn't matter. What I do now is to put a frame around this picture. So having felt that calling always, regardless of, mm-hmm. of what I've done, um, it kind of intersected then, and the impetus for the book is I walked the Camino de Santiago in about a decade ago now with my son, and it's a spiritual pilgrimage across Spain. Um, quarter of a million people do it every year. And in walking this pilgrimage, 
Uh, you meet people, you talk, you have your go-to, hey, what do you do for a living, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I couldn't get people to understand on a spiritual pilgrimage. I couldn't get them to understand what I did as a vocational pastor hmm. that, uh, I give my life to the church. They said, so you're a priest. I said, no, I'm not a priest. Well, what do you do? And I would describe what I do. And they would say, oh yeah, so you're a priest. And, and we, we could never connect. And what I felt was here I am a follower of Jesus with this, this passion to reframe the this, this hmm. story of Jesus in a way that people will give it a second and third or fourth look. And I couldn't articulate that. And I'm walking this Camino for 30 days. We walk 28 days across Spain and I felt helpless and I felt a crisis of interpretation is what Walter mm -hmm. Brueggemann calls it. Well, Alan Hirsch, uh, my co-author in this book felt the same way based upon his experience at Burning Man in uh, Playa of Nevada. And so it was this crisis of interpretation we said, what has happened to this wonderful mystery of the gospel that, that we kind of give our lives to that, that we're not able to, to tell it in a way that's fresh and new. And, and even though I felt called for 30 years previous to do that. And so this book is a wrestling out of what it means to, to take on this crisis of interpretation head on and to call out the church, to call out followers of Jesus, to say, we have missed something in our storytelling. We've taken a story that changes our own lives and changes the world. And, and what we say is we've, we've been bad stewards. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad story to tell. It's not a bad picture to show. It's the best story. It's the best picture. So the problem is not the story we have to tell. The, the problem is our stewardship of this story. And so that was the impetus to write this book and say, how do we do this better? The most creative people in the world should be those that are empowered by a spirit beyond our understanding. And yet the least creativity, the least, uh, the least reframing, good reframing is happening by followers of Jesus. Something, something's yeah. got to give there. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think one of the reasons that your book is so helpful is because it is very honest about what the problems are, but also very clear about the questions and the things that we can be addressing. Why are more Christians and people of faith not putting things into that cultural stew to shape that that uh, shape the culture that we live in? Um, yeah, why that? Another quote from the book that you, we seem powerless to communicate a story of God and its real potency, and that is it. What what is that about? Yeah, I, I think we I think we drain it. I think the phrase you use we, we siphoned out the power of the story of the gospel. It yeah. should it should blow our minds. The analogy we use is Don Everett's analogy, uh, who talked about um, the difference between tofu and the warheads candy. Yeah, tofu is uh, which nothing against tofu eaters on this, but uh, tofu just absorbs the flavors of whatever it's around, and so it becomes that. That's one way to tell the story of the gospel. But if you've ever had Warheads candy, <laughs> you realize that when you put that in your mouth, it either is, get this out, it's the worst thing I've ever tasted, or oh my, I see colors I've never seen before. <laughs> and and the gospel of Jesus, the story that we tell of, of this resurrected Jesus, it should be Warheads. Mm -hmm. And the church has siphoned it. And I think they've siphoned it because I I think we're afraid of what it means to challenge people with such a countercultural message. Mm -hmm. um, I think we also want to make it easier because if we make it easier, more people will join it. If more people join, then we can keep giving them our tofu and our church numbers will grow and we'll keep having a job. And, and that that's antithetical to the gospel. And so mm -hmm. there's got to be a way to, to allow that power to come out in, in a way. And I, I think the imagination, I think the arts, I think good storytelling is the way to do yeah. that. We should not be the worst storytellers in the world. We should be the best storytellers in the world. One of the, the, the quotes that I've had for two decades that I finally got to use in this book was uh, the story from uh, uh, Tolbert Fanning and, and uh, um, David Lipscomb, where they talk about uh, how uh, uh, Lipscomb always believed that the Bible should be, here's the quote, he, 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 the Bible keeps men on safe ground and clips the wings of imagination. 
and we should make the Bible the only and safest teacher of duty to men. And at a funeral uh, for uh, Tolbert Fanning, uh, a eulogy was given for him, who was a mentor of Lipscomb. And, and here's the quote that is the saddest of all laments, but I think describes our struggle and our challenge and what you're trying to do with, with your calling, what I'm trying to do with my calling. He said in a eulogy, and let me remind you, a eulogy is intended to be a good thing about someone. Mm. He said, he weaved no plume, he waved no plumes, he wreathed no garlands, he was destitute of poetry and barren of imagination. That is just horrific, but that is also what the church has become because yeah. somewhere this whole theological idea that that we're not supposed to be imaginative, we're just supposed to take the scripture literally and allow it. So I, I'm all about authority of scripture. I, I, I rarely would get questioned or pushed on that, but I think the authority of scripture allows me to be more creative and more imaginative. And, and that's what we have missed. And that's the, that's the hill we're trying to climb uh, and, and the stories that we're telling. And do you find when you explain that within ministry circles that, that there's a, yeah, uh, that is that, is that the general sense out there at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. really good it news. Is. <laughs> it is, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and because it's been suppressed for so long, yeah. um, the church doesn't know how to handle that. I'll tell you the book that, uh, one of the, it's my favorite, it's, it's, it is my favorite book, probably the one that's been most impactful to me was I was at a theater conference probably 25, 30 years ago. And I wish I could remember who recommended it to me, but someone said, read the book, My Name is Asher Leff. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with the mm -hmm. book by Chaim Potok. Mm -hmm. It is a book about a young boy named Asher Lev who's growing up in the 50s in a Hasidic Jewish, Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, New York. And he has the gift of art. He cannot stop drawing. Yeah. He cannot think differently. And, and the whole story is this, father-son relationship, the son with the church, the son with the, you know, the Jewish school that he's in. How do they take someone with the gift of art and implement that into a faith that doesn't know how to handle art? Yeah. Changed my life. I reckon I buy, I have multiple copies on my shelf here in my office that I hand out to anybody that is struggling with this. Those are the type of discussions that we need to have in the church and we're not having them in the church. Right. That's why this challenge is, is, is so huge to us. Yeah. Yeah. When you're talking about the power of and, you know, that immediately I'm thinking about improv and yes, and, and, you yeah, know, yeah. paradox and all these kinds of things. And I think, it, yeah, I think like if I were in charge of everything, the, the end result of this, it all adds up to, we need to really invest in artists and storytellers and poets and performers. Um, and that, uh, it, it would be good. It would be really good news if that starts to become part of that that conversation. Um, it's it is exciting to hear that people are thinking maybe more deeply about how do we make that happen. We're trying to overcome decades of the artists yeah. being marginalized in our churches, and so if they've been on the edges for so long, how do we make a space for them to 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 come back to us? Yeah, and I understand there's a prophetic edge to to the artist, but. I also understand that the church is lacking the prophets today. And so yeah. we have to provide that space for them to speak those words to us, not yeah. just speak those words, but create that art. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting, um, I think that's, that's part of what we're trying to approach through soul makers is understanding, okay, there's this cultural need in the larger culture. There's a need within the church, but at this time where it's, past time for for that to be essential artists are f for uh, in in a large part not equipped to take on that role you know to because they feel insecure about their gift or or their right to speak into things theologically or even to know um how to do that you know if i is this going to make delegitimate delegitimize me as an artist? Is it going to delegitimize myself as a Christian? You know, there's just so much fraughtness at this point, um, but also creating discipleship uh, and spiritual formation pathways that really speak to what does it look like to be prophetic and an imaginative visionary and that kind of, what's the responsibility that goes with that? Um, and and so that yeah you're this deeply formed mature person who can have the freedom to create whatever and not be controlled by um, structures that are limiting from an artistic perspective. 
Well, I mean, you're speaking prophetically there to pastors when you get us to think about how are we spiritually forming people? Because there are a lot of different ways to spiritually form people. One of them that I think is, is some of the most ineffective is engineering spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a part of our faith community, then we'll do this and then do this, and then we'll move you from here to here, and we'll move you here to here. I think it can happen. I'm not trying to invalidate that. But what I think we should be about is creating environments for spiritual formation to happen. Yeah. And that allows a freedom, uh, both artistically, but intellectually too, to say, I'm not going to engineer your spiritual growth. I'm going to create spaces for spiritual formation to happen. Right. And again, churches have fear of doing that, of what that means, because then you're going to end up wrestling with questions you don't want to wrestle with. And the whole point of the faith is not to make it easier. And the whole point of faith and, and a vocational pastor is not to give you the answers. I was, like I said, I planted a church 15 years ago. Um, every Sunday, almost every Sunday, I would say, look, if you leave here today after I've taught and you have your questions answered, I will have failed. Mm -hmm. But if you leave here with more questions and answers, I will consider that a huge success. Yeah. I am not to be your Bible answer man. All I'm trying to do in my role then as a teacher, preacher, lead pastor was to have the first word on a subject, not the last word on a subject. That freedom is so powerful. There's so there's so much there that artists can do. I, I find this, you know, the conversation about what artists who are Christians <clears throat> might look like, or what the what we produce might look like, seems to be so limited. And I think it goes back to that justification model of showing, you know, that you outline in in mm -hmm. the book. Yeah, it's a it's a quote that's later in the book that this is what you're reminding me of. G.K. Chesterton. Uh, talked about, quote, I don't deny that there should be priests to remind men that they will one day die. I only say that at certain strange times in history, it is necessary to have another kind of priest called poets actually to remind men that they are not dead yet. Yeah. Um, that quote for me, we, we, one of the rejected titles of the book was another kind of priest oh. because we, we, we believe in that. And and who are these priests? They are the poets, they're, 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 they're the visual artists, there's the theatrical artists, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. These are the prophets. I, I look at, uh, some would disagree with me here, but I think the comedians of today are our prophets. I mean, they're speaking words they from are. culture into culture that the church has to seriously consider. Yeah. And we don't, even, we don't even think about giving them a, a, a place to, to listen, a platform to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I think um, you know, as I as I've been doing this work and working with artists for almost twenty years, um, I it, it's interesting to me that I I think I'm getting to a place where I'm seeing that the the difficulty is is deeper than I expected. To fr we talk about free the artist is one of our our hashtags, um, and it depends on what tradition you're from as to what your hang up is. But it does seem that this this limited perspective around what story we can tell and how how we should be thinking or questioning in in the church has kind of really wormed its way into the heads of a lot of Christian artists. So it's not it's not even just a, mag a matter of um, like it's it's getting that it's not just a matter of of churches and church leaders giving permission. It's reorienting artists to trust their own thoughts and instincts and believe that they are that the questions are okay to engage and it's okay, you know, that it doesn't answer the question and all that kind of stuff. I, even if they know intellectually and they've been saying, "Give me the freedom, give me the freedom," it's like that cage bird kind of thing. It's it's very difficult at this point to kind of undo. The limitations, even if they're crazy, even the ones who, you know, it's like either it's super integrated and they only do art in church and it's Jesus art, you know, or it's worship art. And there's been a lot of focus and a lot of, we've come a long way with creativity in church in the last 15 years, or it's, um, I'm an artist out there and I do all kinds of crazy and amazing things, but it doesn't have anything to do with my spiritual life. And I wouldn't go there for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah. Or, or, you know, or the sense that like my most powerful witness is 
my life as a Christian. But again, it doesn't have anything to do with with my my work. And you're talking about, um, well, you know, disrupting and illuminating and inspiring and discomforting and all these things that artists can do, and and this other kind of priest. What does that look like? Like we don't need artists as preachers, right? Mm -hmm. But right. you suggest these new kinds of priests and prophets. What what does that what does that look like? Yeah, I, I think it looks like um, I think it looks like people understanding to follow Jesus as a as a calling and a mission, and. I think it looks like people understanding that nothing should get in the way of that call. Um, no structure, no, um, no controlling um, person over someone else, but that nothing should get way of what you've been called to do. And, uh, you know, it's the story it's, it's fresh in my head of Mark chapter two and the paralytic being lowered through the roof for Jesus to, to heal him. And um, they were willing to do anything to get their friend healed, even if that meant climbing a roof, digging a hole and lowering him down, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the most creative acts in all of scripture. Um, I, they refused to allow the literal structure to get in way of their mission, which was to get their friend healed. Um, if we understand our calling is to, um, and I, I think it is, um, you know, there's a lot of different debates on, not debates, but there's a lot of different answers on, if you ask someone, why did Jesus come into this world? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of scriptural answers to seek and save the lost, et cetera, et cetera. All those are good and, and, and true. I would answer the question, if you ask me, why did Jesus come into this world? It was to give people a picture of God that they'd never seen or experienced before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our calling is to give a picture of God that people have never seen or experienced before. Jesus did that with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter four. He did it with Nicodemus in John chapter three. Time and time again, that's what Jesus was doing. And he did it in a way the religious leaders could not understand, could not comprehend, could not make sense of. And yet that's what he did. So for artists, my call is to go, how do you give the world a different picture of God than they've ever seen or experienced before? And then that takes the form of all the traditional arts. It does take the form of, of living creatively. It does take the, the understanding that we are all called to live a story with our lives. And that's what you're talking about. Uh, I think it's Charlie Peacock that said years ago, uh, our lives are going to tell a story whether we want them to or not. Right. And that's true. So I'm going to I'm going to be in control of that. I am called to tell and live a story to give people a picture of God that people have never seen or experienced before. And I think that can be done in any way that you are gifted to do it by God. Right. And so I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what we're trying to call people towards. Yeah, I, I think that that's the core and the freedom that then can come from that is is just this multiplicity of of creative artifacts and outpourings and innovations and all kinds of things to really focus on that that living out that story and i think that matched with what you talk about in the book uh, around disenchantment and demystification and all of that stuff i think understanding the level at which that uh, kind of naming that at the level at which that is a part of our culture could be a real clue for artists to understand oh okay well that i could i can get in there can you talk talk a little bit about what what the problem you know what's what are we talking about when we're talking about this disenchantment thing yeah the and that's the conflict of the book is when we talk about how we've taken a god that is far wider than i can ever reach or understand and we've reduced that god down to uh, a napkin. <laughs> if 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 you can if you can explain my God to me on a napkin, I don't think that's my God because my God is bigger than that. Um, which then has resulted in us reducing the story of of Jesus, uh, the the gospel that should be a warhead and not a piece of tofu. And then that has then as a result 
uh, reduced our lives. We live far reduced lives. That's the conflict of the book in a way. And the way that we say that and propose that the story has been reduced, the way that the we call it three ways to make tofu <laughs> and that it's this whole idea of we have taken the myth out of the story. Now, when people think of myth, they think of, oh, you mean like a fairy tale, like something that's not true. No, no, no. We define myth as something that is more true than what we can understand. Uh, a myth as we define it is something that helps us make sense of a senseless world. We have taken the myth out of the gospel story. We have taken uh, mystery, so we have demystified it. We have taken out wonder, and, and we want a very logical, rational faith. When our faith is not logical, it's not rational, it wouldn't be faith if I can prove it to you. And we've taken that wonder and that mystery out. And mystery doesn't mean that it can't be understood. Mystery means it can be endlessly understood. And that's what we have taken out from the story. And then we have, we call it depoeticizing. We have taken the poetry out. We have become barren of imagination and destitute of poetry. And so it's, it's those, those are the three that we focus on early in the book where we say, we've taken the myth out, we've taken the mystery out, we've taken the poetry out. And then later the book in what I would call the crucible of the book is, what if we considered re-mythologizing and re-mystifying and re-poeticizing? And, and I hope that people read that part, regardless of what context they come, as part of their calling. If you're a pastor reading that, yeah, you need to be thinking of different ways that you can talk about this and tell this story of God because you've been, uh, it sounds very critical. We have at times, all of us told it very poorly. How do we do that? But if you are an artist um, in, in whatever art form that may be, how do you bring mystery back to the story? How do you bring the myth back? How do you, uh, how do you, use the story of God to make sense of a rather senseless world that we live in. And we live in an incredibly senseless world at times. Mm -hmm. How do we reinsert the poetry and the emotion? How do we use those as frames? So that's, that's the journey we're taking people on in the book is, is go, how do we first acknowledge and recognize the reduction that we have given to God, to his story? And then how do we allow that to become what it was intended to be in the first place? Because our calling as followers of Jesus is to participate in putting the world back together. But putting the world back together does not consist of reducing it to a, a pamphlet that I can hand my neighbor. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't also consist of a painting that may be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Those are just starting points to enter into a, a mythology and a mystery and a, and a world of emotion and poetry and imagination that gives the proper space to the story of God that is about how he puts the world back together through Jesus and how, as we as followers of him, participate in that same story. That's, that's the challenge that we're trying to nudge people, yeah. push people, at times kick people towards <laughs> as we unpack it in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think people in the church today are looking for the easy uh, paint-by-numbers gospel. I don't. Right. I don't think people today are looking for the the tofu type of jesus i really believe they're looking for transcendence i really believe they're looking for the burning bushes all over the world and and we've we've doused out the burning bushes so that we can just make it easier for the people to understand i i say all the time that uh, most churches and i think that's fair most churches are pretty good at exegeting scripture of taking the word and you know authority of scripture and explaining it but we are horrible at exegeting culture. Mm. Uh, we don't know how to understand the longings of the people um, that we say we want to tell the story to. I, I call it a lack of missional anthropology. Mm. We, we just don't, we don't understand anthropologically speaking, this mission that we've been called to this, this calling that we have of God. And and without understanding that we're going to keep feeding people the same thing we've been feeding them over and over. But when you realize they're looking for something deeper and, and broader and wider and more mysterious, um, that causes us then to understand people in a different way and say, look, I'm having the same struggle as you, but I'm searching for the same thing. So can we understand what they really are longing for, what they're really searching for, what they really deep down, what is the, the German word C.S. Lewis writes about it is Zinzuk, 
Hmm. We all have this this longing, or D.H. Lawrence has a poem called The Humming of Unseen Harps. Hmm. Uh, he has a line in a poem called that. I think there is a humming uh, in all of us that the church as a whole sometimes refuses to recognize because we need to make it easier so we can have more people come. Hmm. But if we can get a handle, just a, a finger on the pulse of that humming, we will realize that what they're longing for is not necessarily what we're giving them because yeah. we have siphoned it of its power and potency. So how do you think, and, and I don't, you may or may not have an answer to this, but how do you think artists who want to be a part of this, how can we approach our ministry leaders as partners in this? You know, without, I, 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 I feel like sometimes there's a little bit of a um it feels it can feel threatening the to this like open ended questioning that kind of stuff and also when you're talking about shifting in an institutional culture that's a huge huge shift uh, yeah they need they need to have the conversations it's very simple but we're talking about relationships we're talking about community yeah. we're talking about um having a type of conversation where you can say have you thought about this mm -hmm. artist and regardless of what it is, but an artist doesn't want to come in and say, here's what you should do at your church. Nobody's going to come into that approach. Right. But artists will go, go, will come in and say, Hey, have you thought about this? I have some questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and things like, honestly, take something, for example, take uh, my name is Ashley Lab, that book and say, uh, pastor, I'm looking for a small group of people that will read this with me. Cause mm -hmm. I want to think and consider what might be, uh, you know, Reformation would be the same way. That's why uh, the book Reformation has impacted more people through learning communities than sometimes the singular reading of them. Yeah. Um, that's why when we lead learning communities around the book, yes, people read the book, but it's not a, it's not a book study. It's, it's we provide places for people to share art every time we have a learning mm -hmm. community. Or what is a frame that you want to put around this picture of Jesus? And it's, it's a fascinating thing. And these, yeah. and these are small groups. This is not content delivery. This is relational. And so I would think any yeah. change of institution comes through these relationships in these communities. And I, th I think you quoted the Yvonne Illich thing earlier yes. where Yvonne Illich talked about how do you change the world? And is it through systems? Is it through this? Is it through this? He said, you change the world by telling an alternative story. Yeah. And so there's a chance that a lot of pastors have these opinions of artists that are this and this and this. Well, tell them an alternative story, yeah. get in a relationship with them, learn together. Um, that's, that's the practical ways that I would encourage artists to, to, to think about it. And, and there comes that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to say it, but uh, uh, it's the tipping point. You know, there's mm -hmm. this thing about the diffusion of innovation and, and you've got, you've got early adopters to an idea you have, I don't know what they all are. Uh, you have the innovators, you have the early adopters, you have the late, uh, early majority, then you have the late adopters and you have the laggards. You're never going to get the laggards <laughs> in a church to come around to this idea of the place of art. But you do have conversations with the innovators and the innovators have conversations with the, you know, the early adopters. And at some point you come over that ridge and there is a tipping point where you go, oh, this is a regular part of my faith now. Yeah. But it, it does take the time and it also takes the conversations with the right people, the innovators and the early adopters who want to wrestle with the questions like that we write about in the book or wrestle with the questions that the Jewish community wrestled with. And my name is Dasha Lev. So practically speaking, I, that's where I would start uh, yeah. is finding those relationships with people of faith. I think that's that's fantastic because it's so doable. And and in the midst of those conversations, you you relate your heart for for the passion you have for for, for the the place of art in my faith. Yeah. And some pastors don't understand that, and some pastors understand it, but they don't know how to implement it. Right. And that's where those conversations happen. And um, yeah, uh, it's a you know it's a it's a slow process. And honestly, some in some places, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I'm not telling people to leave churches, but there are some churches that are open to that, and there's some that aren't. And sometimes, sometimes you have to find those places that are that are willing to ask the questions, even when we don't have the answers. Yeah. Uh, because art is a path that takes us down into the depths of those questions. 
Yeah. Um, I find much more meaning in those questions than I do in the answers. Well, I think I th that sounds really, really good and really invitational. And um, again, I, I, you know, that's so practical, the relational aspect of it, keeping it relational. And that really does result in the most lasting foundational kinds of, of change and growth and that sort of thing. It's, it's good. Well, and we, we all need that community. And if you're an artist out there and you feel alone, um, um, then let's do something about that. Let's mm -hmm. find people, whether it's in person or uh, we no longer have to be face to face, although we all prefer that, but right. we, we can be together in community and support each other, yeah. and encourage each other and, and organizations and, and movements that you like your organization and the movement that you're a part of that, that is integral and vital to making places for artists to become aware that, that they're not alone, yeah. that they're, they're not little Asher love shoved to the side of an aesthetic Orthodox Judaism, but instead they are people that are given the chance to express themselves in so many different ways us working together to support each other and create spaces like you are creating. We need to find those. We need to be a part of those. Um, yeah. Well, this is kind of shifting, shifting gears. Um, but I did really want to get your thoughts on something because you in the book talk about developing skills for critical thinking and, and, you know, constructive cultural engagement. That's one of the principles for, for, um, for soul makers. Um, I, I'm just wondering, is that, what are some of the things that you think about uh, that are essential or we should be thinking, we should be practicing, we should be developing? Um, I just, uh, you talk about that some in the book and I'm wondering if you would talk about that now, like how, how, how do we help people develop those skills? Because I think that that is essential for preparing artists um, and Christian, anybody to go to be able to connect and engage the world in a way that's really meaningful, um, to be able to do that from a very deeply mature place is that's that's not not everybody's ready for that. So how do we how do we mm -hmm. get ourselves ready for that? Yeah, I think it's kind of cultivating the ground a bit. There is a phrase that we use in our faith community. Uh, all I know is not all there is. Mm -hmm. And this whole idea, no, no one, I don't, I've not met anybody yet that's arrogant enough to say, look, all I know is all there is. There's <laughs> nothing else. I got nothing else. So, but I believe that, that um, even though not saying it, we are believers in that sometimes mm -hmm. that we're like, look, I've, I've learned this seminary, college, my job, whatever. And really all I know is all there is. I think, first of all, you have to cultivate that ground and say, and dig it up and say, you know what, all, all we know is not all there is. And it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, all we're trying to do is give the first word on a topic, uh, on a subject, on an idea, not the last word, because that last word is not for us to define, but the conversation is for us to have. And so I, like I said, I, I turned 60 this year and uh I have learned more in the last 10 years of my life than I did in the first 50 years combined. Mm. And as I get older, that's going to be harder, but I want to always be able to say that. Mm. I want to be able to say I've learned more in the last 10 years than I learned in the previous however many years beforehand. And I think there is a maturity that comes when we teach people a way of thinking that says, I want to learn more but I'm expecting to understand less. Mm. I'm not going to read just the authors that I already agree with. I'm not going to look for just some content input. I'm going to look for somebody that pushes me to a whole different place. That means I read people that I don't necessarily always read or that I've been told to run away from. Mm. I'm going to understand that when I finish reading that book, and I hope Reformation has been that for people, is and maybe that's one reason why sometimes it's hard to get completely through the book because it's like, wait, these are way too many questions. I can't go anymore. But that's the whole idea is, could we push ourselves to learn more, think more, and understand less? 
not learn more and think more and come up with more answers, but come up with more questions. I look, I'm sitting in my office here and I look over here and I've got three shelves on a, on a bookshelf that I call my heretic shelf because most people <laughs> that I know would, would call a lot of those authors heretics. But I have learned so much about Jesus and my faith and I've been so spiritually formed. Do I agree with everything in those books? Absolutely not. Right. Uh, and I, I understand this is a slippery slope. Uh, I, uh, one of the first places that Al Hirsch and I spoke, I won't say which college it was, but we were, <laughs> we were uh, the book was being released that week and they had us speak and do a couple of workshops. And we were talking about this idea of questions and, and learning more and understanding less and, and also talking about our cultural engagement and the fact that I can learn more from the stories that are told in, in this episodic show or this movie right. than I can other things. And the person stood up and said, well, isn't that a slippery slope? Because you're inviting people and, and maybe they'll fall and never come back. And I said, it is a slippery mm -hmm. slope. I, I, I'll affirm that in you. But I think it's a much more dangerous slippery slope if we don't encourage them to go there. If we don't encourage them to think critically. Yeah. If we don't encourage them to go, like, if you just take your pastor's word for interpretation of the scripture without actually reading it yourself, that's a little too robotic for me. Yeah. And, and as a pastor for 36 years, I don't want you to do that. Yeah. And so this type of, of critical thinking and wrestling around, and, and you can see examples of it in the scripture. I mean, you look at Paul in Athens, that's the passage that everybody wants to talk about from Acts chapter 17 and how he, you know, Paul in Athens uh, understood the people's dominant stories. He understood the dominant story of what gods with small g were about. He understood the poets of the day. He, he understood what they were longing for and what they were searching for. He didn't do that without critical thinking. He yeah. didn't do that by going, well, let me just come in and give you the gospel of Jesus. He understood that he needed to engage again back to relationship in a way that gives that gave himself a hearing with the people because he was willing to wrestle around. And uh, it's fascinating, a couple times in Acts, Paul never even mentions the name Jesus, but he's teaching the resurrected Jesus. But what Paul did was give the people a view of God, a picture of God that they'd never seen or experienced before. It's real easy to look at the New Testament and see that time and time again. Yeah. Acts chapter 10 with Peter and Cornelius and the vision he had, and, and he's called to love people and churches and faith communities and small groups and one-on-one -on -one conversations, we need to cultivate that in each other. If we are going to, to think critically, if we are going to wrestle with these things critically, then we're gonna to have to cultivate that and give each other a safe space. Yeah. Not expecting people to come to small group with all the answers, but instead expecting them to come to small group or to come to church or to be in a conversation with more questions. Yeah. That will lead us to think about things and, and learn more and learn more all the time entering into a mystery that helps us, that uh, propels us to understand less. There's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. which there'll be plenty of people disagree with me on that, but I would, uh, I would fight. I would fight for that one. <laughs> yeah. No, that is so hopeful and yeah. And life-giving. I really, I really appreciate all that you just said. I, I, I'm, I, as I was preparing for our conversation, I started realizing more and more, oh, this is really helpful for, um, we kind of, we talk about calling in three phases of be, make, and do, becoming who you're created to be, making what you were created to make, focusing on developing your skills and gifts and talents, and then doing what you were created to do. And that's where this, uh, this principle is about developing the capacity for critical thinking and developing the, the fortitude really for courageous action. And that is such a huge, that do piece is such a huge one. And I just, I, I, going through the book again, I was like, oh, this, this is a great tool um, for helping people to get there without necessarily um, going to seminary or, you know, setting a whole, to develop those tools for doing theology really through their work, which is just exactly what, what you've outlined of asking those questions and putting asking the question in the context of God's story and saying, okay, how does this play? How does this, this doesn't line up. That feels uncomfortable. Why is that? What's going on there? Like that's theology, but being able to provide a way that's relational and conversational is really helpful. Well, it's understanding too, that the bigger picture 
of theology and life of faith is not about what we've reduced it to over the years. I have um, behind me here in my office, a huge window, and it's a window from a house I used to live in. And this is a four foot by four foot window. I mean, it's old and antique. And as I, this ha- this window is my favorite part of the house that I lived in. Hmm. I lived in this little rural town in Indiana for 10 years. And it was my favorite part of the house because I would look out that window and and there was a street light and it was a main street of this little town. And especially when it would snow, it was the most gorgeous thing you've ever seen. Hmm. And we turn off all the lights in the house and stand there and look out that window. And those snowflakes looked as big as my head falling down. It was like my own private Narnia out there. And it was just, it was just gorgeous. Well, one day my kids were playing, my boys were playing, and they threw this little soft, this, this little ball that was cushiony, but somehow it cracked this window, just, just the bottom right-hand corner of the, one of the panes, the, one of the four panes. And so I would go and I would look at that. And, and every now and then I didn't get it fixed. It didn't need to be fixed, but it just, it was there. And every now and then I would go look at this window and I would see that crack and I go, oh, I need to get this. Oh, this is broken. And oh, wow, look, there's a lot of dirt between the screen and this window. And oh, man, there are thousands of dead ladybugs there. I really should get something and remove those. And man, this is, oh, man, this this is bad. But this was the same window that I would go to and look out on a snowy morning or a snowy evening and just have my breath taken away. What I realized was there is such a difference between looking at a window hmm. and looking through a window. When I look at a window, I see all the bugs. I see the crack. I see what's broken and needs to be fixed. But when I look through, I see a beauty that is beyond my current life. I see a beauty that transcends the dead lady bugs. Right. And, and our calling in the church and, and what we've reduced it to is to look at the bugs, look at the cracks, fix your life, do this, get rid of sin, here's the solution, believe this prayer, write this on a napkin. When I'm going, okay, cool, but let me look through this window and understand that I have a God who relentlessly pursues me, that is that is after me, that invites me into a mystery that is far beyond my normal life, that invites me into a story that I get to play a part in. I'm just not a reader of this story, I'm a participant in this story. And however he has gifted me and called me, I'm supposed to live that out. That's what I see when I look through the window. Yeah. Artists, non-artists, followers of Jesus, non-followers of Jesus, if we could give them this view of what the bigger picture is, yeah. they'll find that transcendence. They'll find that, that, uh, that sense of longing being met. The humming that is in their hearts will find things that, that reach out to it, that, that comfort it, that give them purpose and meaning. If we can stop looking at the window and look through the window, I, I think it changes us. So we're pushing people through this book, through your ministry, through, through churches that understand this whole idea. We're, we're pushing them to this bigger picture of God. Stop reducing God to a little pamphlet. Allow God to be God. Allow the story of the gospel to be the story. Again, it's not the story that's the problem. It's our stewardship of the story. We can tell and live better stories. We can tell and live more beautiful stories than we're doing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that I just feel like that is such a perfect note to end on because it it's such an invitation and it says so much. I'm I'm just so grateful for for this conversation and and the chance to to get to meet you and and connect. And I hope it's just the beginning of a connection. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled. This is we could obviously we could talk about this all day. I feel it's like we could. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, this Mark, this has just been a great, great conversation, and I, I really do appreciate. It. I appreciate the work that you're doing, and I appreciate the the encouragement that you've shared as well. And I'm I'm looking forward to being able to share this with all my friends and people that are <laughs> all the artists that that we're connected with. So thank you. Well, I'm grateful for the conversation. I'm grateful for the calling that that you're answering in your life, and this is great stuff. We we should all be talking about this all the time. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
Wow, there is just so much <laughs> in that conversation. He has so many great thoughts and suggestions and ideas. I just I just want to go away and process them all. <laughs> I know. I love his approach. Yeah. I love the approach that you know, there is a problem in the communication. There is a problem of how maybe the organizations were were approaching it. And he took the discipline to do the work. Mm -hmm. He didn't whine and complain or start, uh, you know, a blame who type of thing or blame this and that. Just to really think about it, to do the work, to write this book with Alan, to get it out there. Um, just takes a lot of strength and I don't know, a lot of faith. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it is refreshing to have something that's so constructive and that gives you tools to do something. Yeah. And you learn time. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how meaningful it is. I think for artists to hear from ministry leaders, from pastors like Mark, that, that what we have to offer is valuable. Yeah. Like I really do think that that's something that's going to really be a, a, a resonate for people and feel really um, good to hear. I think if artists had spiritual mentorship on a weekly basis, I think that would change a lot of things on how artists work and approach their work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really hope that this conversation is is healing and encouraging to a lot of people. Um, I'm really grateful that he took that time. Thank you so much for listening to Be Make Do, a Soul Makers podcast. We'd love it if you could like this episode and subscribe and follow the podcast. This has been our first season of Be Make Do, and we've taken a quick overview of the call of the artist, but we've got so much more coming up for you with more great conversations and concrete ideas and suggestions. And we're going to start with an in-depth look at the wise-hearted ones in Exodus. I cannot wait to get started. Thanks for listening to Be Make Do, a Soul Makers podcast. Let us know what you think about this episode on Spotify or leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcast. If you'd like to interact or ask us a question, leave us a comment on Instagram at Soul Makers Podcast. Be sure to sign up for our exclusive newsletter at soulmakers.org. All links and resources pertaining to this episode can be found in our show notes, including where to find Mark Nelson and Alan Hirsch's book, Reformation. See you next time.